name is down here. So the subject today is behavioral responsiveness in web development, uh, past, present, and future. And then why do we have past, present, and future? Well, we need to look a little uh, back in history. Uh, what is behavioral responsiveness? What is uh, behavior and responsiveness? And, and the background for it. Uh, we're also looking a little at what's going on right now. We will have a small glimpse into some machine learning, uh, some prediction, stuff like that. And then we'll try and look ahead and see how can we uh, work with these concepts in the future and what will be the reality of the World Wide Web in the next three to five years. Because the internet as we know it today is gone in five years and something quite new is going to happen. So let's dig a little into it. Um, Let's see if I can, I couldn't, there. So that's me, I know you can recognize me, I take up a lot of space, so also on the slides. Uh, I'm the founder of RedWeb that has a, a truckload of different services in different countries and we're the biggest human consultancy agency on the planet. Um, <laughs> I used to be a developer, then a front-ender and many other things. And I make a living of going out to clients, sitting down with board members, managers, CEOs, and then I ask them, um, what's the dead turd on the interwebs with your company name on it? And they look at me and say, what? Yeah, I mean, I can see your company here. It's a super good company. You're very good at running your business. But what's the turd doing on the internet with absolutely no activity and nothing to offer for your clients? Um, um, and a lot of CEOs and managers in, in corporations, organizations, and businesses today has not been taking the internet seriously for many years, actually never. <laughs> so, so I start to ask, them, well, well, how many times a week are someone calling your company and, uh, and requesting an invoice copy? Uh, they might go, well, three to 400 times a week. So did, did you consider maybe integrating that service from your ERP system to your website so they could actually go to your website, log in and download their own uh, copies of the invoices. No, they didn't really do that. Um, okay, so how many want to contact your com company after four o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, quite a lot, but are your phones open? No, our phones are not open after four o'clock. So why don't we do self-service solutions? So a lot of what I do is actually going out to, to companies and then talk to them and get them into a, a, a digitalization process of their businesses and, and transforming their businesses into a business that is also digital, that is also online, that is also running 24 seven, that utilizes self-service. Now, when you work with something like that, then you start to see some patterns. You see patterns in multiple companies. You start to see some trends and some tendencies. And one of those, is something about responding to user needs, to user requirements, to, to changing user behavior. So we'll dig a little into that. Um, first, a small agenda, a small introduction, a little about behavior, something about meaning, something about patterns, something about behavioral responsiveness. Uh, if we get time, uh, a little time for questions, and then I'll end up saying thank you. But let's dig into it. It's a big subject, and someone might have a question or two, so let's see if we can do it. In, a, in the world of machinery is actually where we first saw behavioral responsiveness. And machinery, this is a Coca-Cola plant. You have all the bottles running through the plant, and then you have small sensors. And the sensors will read what's happening with the bottles. If something is broken, if there's something inside the bottle, the sensor will pull out the bottle. So the machine is reacting to the behavior of the flow in the pattern that flows by. This is, of course, the, the Coca-Cola plant is a little newer version, but, but this was the first uh, sort of kind of, of, of behavioral responsiveness, and we, it was within machinery. <coughs> so the definition, the ability of a machine or a system to adjust quickly to sudden altered external conditions as of speed, load or temperature, and to resume stable operation. So we have a little like this too. Um, if you're using a CDN and some parts of your website structure is down, then the CDN has multiple sources that can take over and make sure that you resume operation. Um, there's many different ways of doing it. Today in hosting, we have load balancing, we have failovers, virtualization, and stuff like that that is focused towards this too. But this was within machinery. <laughs> it gets more fun. 
In computer science, um, the definition uh, of the ability uh, of the hard software to respond to changing behavior is a little uh, is a little better. Try to dig into it. The specific ability of a system or functional unit to complete a assigned task within a given time. For example, it would refer to the ability of an artificial uh, intelligence system to understand and carry out tasks in a uh, timely manner. And with this, you actually talk about response times also. So yeah, if we're using a computer program or system, how quick is it to respond to the user's input? So suddenly, instead of with machinery, of it being some responding to what was going on and resuming normal operations. Now we're also talking about what's the time involved? How do we react to things? How quick are we serving it? But um, <coughs> uh, as you can see here, the long delays to be a major cause of user frustration. frustration. So the, the responsiveness on time started to become a factor also in behavior responsiveness. Um, <coughs> You can see there's something called the HCI, human-computer interaction. It didn't exist, of course, back in machinery, but with the computer science and computer age, the HCI uh, term uh, came on, 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 on stage, and suddenly people started to consider a time factor, too. Um, but really, uh, it isn't the golden answer, right? Uh, as we can see here, it says, since we cannot afford faster computers, I mean, to live up to the requirement of responsiveness in time, we're going to hire slower workers because that will make our computers seem faster. So that's the sort of response, it's a behavioral response. Our computers are too slow, so we have, sl we, 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 uh, our, our computers are too slow, so we hire slow workers because then everything fits together. It's maybe not what we want to do, right? <coughs> so then we have responsiveness in, in marketing. And you say, traditionally in marketing, you had marketing 1.0, you're talking about, yeah, this is a car, six valves, 2.4 liters engines, can do this and this and this. Then around, that was the Ford car, was one of the first really big marketing campaigns. Then 40 years later, you had marketing 2.0, and marketing 2.0, you start saying, well, if, if you see a car driving up to the mountains, there's two girls in the car, but only one driver. Oh, so if you buy the car, you get the extra girl. Let's, let's drive to the mountain. I'm buying the car, I'm getting the girl. So that was sort of a different form of, of statement. In, in, in marketing 3.0, we're starting to, to do a concurrence of values, of values between uh, the, the senders and the recipients uh, between customer and, and provider. And, and part of going on to behavioral uh, elements of marketing is that we do targeting, we do retargeting. So if someone goes into one of our websites, and they read a specific element, then we will tag them up, and now we will continue following them. So as they go to other websites with Google AdWords on it, uh, Google AdSense on it, then our AdWords will be shown to them because we know they've been in our network, and we're starting to target and we're starting to respond and react to people. So based on people's behavior, Google is actually making a lot of money today on, 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 on something called uh, behavioral responsiveness. But, um, but with some limitations. They can only do it with cookies and with sessions, identifying the individual. So there's some clear um, limitations to that. Now, in web development, uh, responsiveness has gotten to this stage. So you say, yes, OK, uh, you have a different screen size. Or you're using an iPhone. And now we will respond and show our website a little different. But we're not really considering the person, we're not considering uh, what we offer to the person, we're not considering what the person is doing, we're actually just responding to the device of the user and not to the user himself. And that's where we are today, that's responsiveness today. Everyone does responsive websites, but maybe we should do something else. <coughs> so, uh, user-centric, and that's an example on social media. Um, some friends of mine, uh, likes this new Lily drone that can follow you. It'll be launched next year. I already pre-ordered one because I thought it looked fun. <laughs> Let's see if it is that too. But so in my friend's dream, they see that some people like something, then they expose it to me, and Facebook makes a living out of this too. So responsiveness and social aggregation is a huge part of what's going on today with, with, with Google, with Facebook, with all the, the, the world's biggest companies. 
So um, we'll try and move a little over to uh, e-commerce. Oh, well, this is an example. But today, because we're basing it on sessions, on cookies, on knowing the user, then we have the issue that we're really good at aggregating known data out, big data, and we can look back in history. Um, and you see, it's, it's based on history and dem demographics. And, uh, and we have a good example here. If you go to a web shop and you're a monkey and you're a member of the shopper group, which name is monkeys, then you go into the category fruits and a small module will show you a featured product. The product will be a banana. Okay, pretty simple. Conversions up by 20%. You sell 20% more food since you started doing that. But what if tomorrow monkeys collectively on the entire planet started saying, we don't like bananas. We want something else to eat and they start buying oranges. Well, if our historical data system is responding to behavior up to two years ago, then we would actually need to wait 12 months plus one day to start to see an effect of the new pattern. So we wouldn't really start to show oranges before more than 50% of our data mass were actually showing the new tendency, not the old tendency. So doing responsiveness based on historic data is not really smart, but it's the only thing we, we used to be able to do. But now we can do something else. <coughs> so let's try and, and move on to search engines. Um, how much time do we have now? Uh, left. left? So, ah, 34 minutes, that's good. So I'll slow a little down. I was worried we wouldn't get to the questions. So we'll move on to the search engines. Um, basically, search engines is about one thing, meaningfulness. If, if people use search engines and they don't get meaningful answers, then they won't be using them. Google cannot respond and show ads that are related to what they search for, so Google will not, not earn money. So search engines are quite quite simple. But what's really interesting is not so much what people searches, but how they search. If we look at content marketing today, everything in content marketing evolves about being able to figure out how people are searching something. So when you build your website, your content hierarchies is, is consistent with the way your target audience is actually searching on the search engines because then there will be an aggregation of value by the search engine robot on your content hierarchy and people will find your landing pages, your relevant and, and high value content pages in the search engines and then they will get there. So the individual landing page, so the individual search of what people actually want is not so interesting. It's the general pattern of how people are searching, how they are finding something meaningful. That's really where it gets interesting. So, uh, <coughs> and, and I've written up here, how we constitute a reality that follows the needs of the user by responding to the user's behavior. That's the key. Uh, when we're done here, I'll share the slides on the slide share. I also, I added a little more text than you would normally do, but I wanted this to be something you could also read in a week or in two weeks or see the video and maybe continue working with it. <coughs> so let's move on to the next one. Keep calm and be helpful. Responsive behaviors is actually quite a well-known theme also in terms of uh, the disease uh, dementia. And we all know when, when people, some people, when they get older, typically at some point they lose the ability to remember stuff and they, they get dementia. So then people found out that even though they're not able to remember it and put their words onto it, then they will have certain patterns of responses. Their arms would move or in certain situations they would start to react. So it was a nonverbal response or reaction to a certain situation when the brain triggered some sort of memory, but they were unable to pull it out. So in, in RB, as it's termed there, you're working with understanding the behaviors of people with dementia to be able to help them have a better life, even though they, are di uh, they have dementia. And that's a really real world application, again, of what is uh, social uh, behavioral responsiveness. And actually, again, like with Google and the search engines and stuff, it's not really uh, the, the one specific thing they do. It's not that they move their arm in a certain way. It's that there is patterns. There is patterns, and in these patterns, there's a lot of answers. 
So we'll move a little into pattern-centric here. We have some small patterns here from a chemistry world. Um, but by analyzing paths of uses, we're able to, to recognize patterns. With these patterns, we are able to re respond to them, to react to them. So it's not like with sessions and cookies and monkeys buying fruit. It, it's, it's not so that, yes, we have all these identifiable uh, customer groups and stuff like that, but it's the ability to go out and look at the entire world and not know a single person and say, okay, we see the flow. We are actually crowdsourcing our, our analytics. We're crowdsourcing the material for how we start to analyze data. We don't really care who the individual is. We care on what they do. And out of that, we, we become pattern-centric and we start to use things to register data and do something. Right now, there's a, a big buzzword called uh, machine learning. Well, I say right now, uh, I think there was a, a movie called War Game once. It was sort of machine learning too. It got a little too smart. Uh, and, and there's lots of examples of, of machine learning over time. But right now, people are starting to use it for predictions. Like if, if, um, if you go into a web shop and you're a monkey, and then you go in and you click once, you click twice, third time, fourth time, and then suddenly we have a pattern. Oh, we noticed that people who went these four steps into our web shop actually bought oranges last week, then we'll show an orange instead of a banana. So we have a pattern and we can use that to predict other people's behavior. So we can actually make the website more meaningful than we could before. So right now, there's some things out on the market. Prediction IO is one of the most interesting things. It's an open source platform. You can download it, deploy it, and you can integrate to it. Google Prediction API was uh, launched not so long ago and pretty much offers an API for, for processing data with machine learning. You also have WiseIO, BigML, and SkyTree, which are like the three remaining of the top five things going on right now. But this is about machine learning and prediction. But in reality, machine learning and prediction is just one small fraction of what it means to operate and work with, with uh, responsive behavior. So, and, and basically, that, that's, yeah, let's see, that's what I just said here. <laughs> so, um, we'll move on while we, we leave the guy to continue to predict the future. And you can say, actually, what I'm doing right now is a little of the same. I see a lot of tendencies and, and uh, trends and patterns, and based on that, I'm claiming that in five years, the internet will be just like I'm saying it will be. And we will, all of us will, will not be focused on creating responsive websites for devices, but for people instead. So let's see, let's meet in five years at the end beyond and see if I was right. <laughs> and if I wasn't, uh, maybe I'll pay the beer. <coughs> yeah. So um, patterns are important to recognize meaningfulness. And, and for Google, it's proven to be able to, to to make Google one of the largest companies in the world with the most money and everything like that, with the most employees and a very thriving and successful business. Um, <coughs> you, know, you probably all know this already, but 42 is always the right answer to everything. Um, that's also a pattern. I haven't been able to prove it yet, but, but there's a strong indication that might be it. Um, <coughs> but the pattern-centricness, is really um, everything. If you work with abstract system architecture, you also look for patterns. You don't look for static cases. You look for states, for structures, for abstracts, so you can be able to respond with your software to changing needs. Um, you work in agile process management with Scrum, but also be looking at some patterns so you can handle uh, changing uh, requirements for the software you're building. So 20 or 30 years ago, we had 20,000 page uh, function descriptions and project specifications. Now we have two pages and an image, but, but we're looking at things differently. We're looking at the patterns and how we're working. We use storytelling, we use wireframes and stuff like that to underline this abstract way of going into a more pattern-based way of working. And when you understand the pattern of the project you're entering into, then you have a way out of it too because you understand the direction. So, so patterns comes in a lot of places. So <clears throat> let's try and move up a little. So, but, 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 but how can we use this and, and 
what questions would we actually like to ask our users when they visit our website? Because the, the, the questions need some sort of purpose or goals. So I've got some here. Why do people show a certain behavior? Uh, what about people's uh, sex or people's uh, age? Um, could we see that people from Denmark are certain showing different behaviors than people from Germany or from uh, France or other places? Well, actually, we can see that. There's a lot of data that shows that. Um, <coughs> we have like five overall user groups or, or user segments. Um, in Denmark recently, uh, the newest number shows that 48% of all the users in Denmark are now in either quality or ecological user groups. They basically are the people with the highest income that spend the most money online. And they want to buy stuff that's good, that has a high quality. They want to buy experiences, travel and eat at good restaurants and stuff like that. So that's 48% of all the users, which is almost half of the users. So you might be able to run a huge web shop of discount parallel import from Asia and everything like that in the south of Europe. And that might be a success right now. But in Denmark, you would only reach 52% of the target market. So, so you have to always figure out what's the patterns the country are in. Now, there's some traditional sub-segments. One is a woman that's out browsing, of the replacement for the woman that went to the store and looked at the clothes and everything and needed to have it in her hands. The woman, that's the, the typical browser, it's stereotyping, but that's, that's what they use in marketing, would go into a web website, would click images, would see videos, would be more visual. And of course, it could be men too, it could be kids too, it could be everyone. But, but they have a more, much more visual approach to actually consuming a website. Then you have the, the, the man engineer who likes technical data. He clicks on text links, on the anchor links goes down into specifications, he uses product filtering, and it becomes very, very heavy and technical. He doesn't click on images at all. So maybe we should start to respond on some of these questions when we realize that we actually don't have one set of users, we have many sets of users, and all of these users could actually use a website that's a little different, that's more built on their terms and not on a, on a one-size-fits-all. So, <coughs> Some of these examples here are based on responses. Um, and if we have the woman that is clicking all the images, then for fuck's sake, let's make the images double, double size. We'll do big images. Or we will change the little product image of a hammer into a picture of a, of a guy that's out in, in a workshop hammering with a full scenario, scenario story behind it. Because we know that works for people that consider browsing and visual experiences. They will buy many times more products if that is what they're presented to. So, and there's a lot to do with this. The engineer guy, he should have filtering. So much filtering that we would die if we used the website with it. But for him, that's what makes him buy stuff. Filtering, technical data, specifications, download 17 PDFs, so PDFs with extra data he can go and mark with. But, but then he'll be happy and he'll buy more. <coughs> so there's a lot of ways to respond to the behavior we see. There's a lot of ways to optimize the computer human interaction and, and the interaction while working and browsing our websites. <coughs> So, and there's a lot of other ways to do it. I mean, if, let's say someone uh, puts stuff in the cart, someone goes to a web shop, adds a product to the cart, and, and then they go to the checkout, and then they go away to another page. Well, maybe we could lock that. We could have an event that registers if people are leaving the checkout, and if they do, maybe we could show a small win and say, would you like 10% discount on the product they just add to, added to the cart? If we are able to respond right away to the behavior we're seeing, then we can quickly do something about it. But in general, with behavioral responsiveness, we need some tools to work with this. I mean, there's no website platform today that offers anything like that. There's some with, with the machine learning, there's Google, uh, uh, Google Prediction API, there's other options, but there's not a, a structured methodology or system for, for actually triggering understanding these things. You could use Google Analytics and do event tracking. You could uh, impose event tracking on many different uh, buttons and features, et cetera, on your website. When someone adds something to the car, you'd have an event that's triggered. 
But Google Analytics itself is not able to respond on anything. You're not even able to see a meaningful dashboard of the data. You'd have to pull everything out and dig all the data out of it. And you'd have to manually respond to it because it's not really structured for that. So the people that actually does build websites, the people that actually develops extensions and CMSs and stuff like that, they need to do something. We need better event systems. We need better logging systems. We need to be able to handle big data. We need to have GeoIP-based systems, archiving systems, aggregation systems, and mythologies and stuff like that. There's a lot of different places where we need better tools to be able to, to work with some of these things. Um, <coughs> right now, we're working on our, we have a, a content marketing uh, product called Red Item. And right now, we're working on the third generation we're working with GUIP basing, we're working with um, AB split testing and stuff like that. So if people go in to a content article, then we can have a small call to action module. And based on where people is actually sitting, uh, let's say in Denmark, we have a client with, with 40 or 50 offices, then typically you won't have the same person covering all of Denmark. You'd have one person for each area. So we read the GUIP signature and we'll check the city or the postal codes and we'll show the relevant people to the person that's coming in. So we try, we, we're starting to respond to what's ongoing. On top of that, we are also adding A-B split testing. So when you do actually put in the individual call to action modules in your content marketing platform, then you can test them. So you can do like two or three different modules and test them and see the effect right away as part of the solution. So we, we're slowly moving towards this um, we also built a, a browser library into Redcall, uh, where we're actually registering people's behavior as they go through the website. We're not using it to predict sales right now, but we're already recording all of the patterns. So we started to aggregate it over to the actual purchasing history. Then we would be able to do it right away and make a small module you could put up on the site that says, I predict you will buy and enable the module, and uh, your turnover goes up by 20%. So, um, yeah, there's just some, some uh, ideas for, uh, for a more general approach to doing this. It could be module-based. I mean, if we want to start this and we want to start it simple, we might not reinvent everything. We might just start with modules. Let's see, how can we use modules to respond to users' behavior? We could use some Google Analytics. We could use some event tracking and then start to respond on modules. Um, or like we're doing in Red Item with, with our call to action modules, we're starting to respond to people in different behavior. But there's a lot of different examples here, clicking on images or links, using search, using filtering, tracking, scrolling. I mean, we, we have a, a metrics in Google Analytics that will show how much average time people are using to read a page. But that number might not make meaning. I mean, we don't know if they're, if they're spending three minutes on the first uh, 10 lines. In reality, if we were tracking how long, how, how much uh, depth there was in reading, we could say a lot more important things about it. Or maybe for each section in our template for, for news articles, we had an event for the uh, introductionary area, and then we had an event for each of the paragraphs going down into the article, and we would suddenly know, oh, but we can see when people have written the seventh paragraph, that's when most people click and we convert. So what are we writing in the seventh paragraph since that's the most efficient one? Maybe we start to, to re respond to things, then do something. Um, of course, there's a lot of different things. If, if we get people in from Facebook, maybe we could respond to that. People from Twitter, oh, someone reacted to a tweet with a link to our website. Well, perhaps we should just pop up a little module saying, hey, I see you come from Twitter. Would you like to follow us on Twitter? Why, why have no one made a module that does that? It should be the easiest thing on the planet to get 10,000 new Twitter followers, Twitter followers like that. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of different ways to work with this. These ex examples were based on modules, but in reality, it could also be templates. You could have, to, uh, you could have a template that loaded one template if you came from Facebook, another if you came from Google, or third if you search on something specifically on Google and you land on the website, then the template will actually adjust and you will see a different experience because we know why people are coming. So, and, and this is actually not that hard. 
This is fairly simple to do from a code perspective too. But of course, once we get real event systems, logging systems and stuff, when we could do really structured and aggregate it out, then we are able to, to revolutionize the world a little, <laughs> page by page at least. <coughs> um, in, in products today, in, in CMSs, etc., we always talk about market disruption. You say market disruption is the ability to disrupt the market with something uniquely that's not in the market. And that will typically mean you have a good product that will be a successful product. Uh, right now, we would say today, Joomla is a part of the CMS market, but we don't really have something that's disrupting. We don't have a feature in Joomla that's disrupting the market anywhere. Maybe this could be a feature like that, or this could be a start on something like that. <coughs> I should have brought a cup of coffee or something. So, um, so overall goals, the final answers, the little alien book. I don't know. So uh, the overall goals here, we could increase complexity. I mean, we're always saying it should be simpler. It should be easier. It should be more approachable, but not for all. For some people, complexity is good. For some people, complexity is what they actually want, what they're searching for. So complexity, complexity could increase. It could also decrease. And, and that's the fun part when we're not when we are not running our, our businesses and building websites on, on the five buzzword uh, ideas that's out right now, but when we actually start to measure and see we can respond, we do something of a higher quality. <coughs> increase or decrease visual elements, increase text amounts or reduce text amounts. It depends on what you're doing, what your users want, what your users want to do. Um, <coughs> feature sets, I mean, first we had adaptive websites in terms of mobile and smartphones. So we made an adapt, adapted version of a website. We changed features and then everything like that. But then everyone said, no, no, we don't want adaptive websites. We want responsive websites. The same website that just responds and we put everything under each other in a long column, 18 pages, 28 pages of scrolling on your smartphone. Wow, we're responding. We're really good at responding. I found a module. Yes, and, and then you know, no one is, is, is scrolling 28 pages on the smartphone. Come on. Maybe adaptive was actually better because at least with adaptive, we were responding to people coming in with a different device that was not built to scroll for 28 pages to find a module in the bottom. At least we were taking things out. We we're, were changing the experience entirely. So maybe adaptive was not so bad and responsive was not so good. Or we need to understand that adopting is a response. Also, it isn't just to do one thing and uniform it. So I think all of these ideas and trends, tendencies combined, of course, with also the traditional way of responding or adapting, using viewports, using demographic data, historical data, all of these things, when you start to combine them, we will be able to create a lot better websites. We'll be able to create a lot uh, more meaningful experiences for people that are actually visiting our websites, our customers' websites. And in the end, I think this will be a game changer in the next three to five years. Those CMSs or those companies that venture into this part of the web first will be the one that takes the, 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 the market shares. And it's the same, the first people that start using responsive websites and stuff, they pretty much got a lot of customers just on that because it was market disruption. And this is also market disruption. So I think the next five years, I think I want to, I want to, to sell websites to clients for say, $50 million doing this. I think that, that will be my goal. Are you selling the book? No, I'm not selling the book, sadly. I should be selling the book, no. No, no, but I'm just saying that, that I want to use this to, to open companies in a lot of different, uh, countries in the world. I want to sell a lot of websites to a lot of big corporations because it's market disruptive. I, I can use this to really create something because we could be the first that are working with this seriously and we could do something with it. So, um, so $50 million in five years on this, that's also kind of a, a statement to make, right? <coughs> yeah, so what's the point? And yeah, I think we already went to most of this. Um, uh, I'll share the slide, put it on Twitter and something, and maybe you can revisit it if you have some questions or ideas. 
you will be welcome to email me and uh, drop me a line or tweet something and, and I'll respond. And uh, if you do something interesting with some of the stuff I've said today, I would like to know. I'd like to retweet it also. And, and I'd like to see some examples. And I mean, some of this could be like a, a four hour module development job just to do something. But if it could create an effect, we're doing something. I mean, WordPress is not doing this. Drupal is not doing this. No one is doing this. So we have a, a full blue ocean with absolutely no competitors in it. Let's get swimming. So um, we'll go to the simple, the, the most simple slide on the deck, the questions. Any questions? Or did I hammer you out completely in the last 30 minutes? <laughs> So, yes? I think basically I would start by trying to, to pick a concrete project. Concrete website, and then I'll start with some user data. Start to get in the head of the users. Do three, four, five, six user cases and dig into the users. Dig into some of the background behind it. Because then you start mentally asking questions to these users. Once you ask questions to these users, then you start to build those ways of asking questions into your software, into a little plugin that monitors something, or module that can respond, that can answer those questions. But having some concrete idea of the users you're working with, to start with some historical data and stuff, do a few interviews with some potential end users and get an idea what's going on and then figure out what's the three most important questions to ask these users and respond to it. What's the three answers I could give these users in the best way to make it more successful, a better experience? And if it's a web shop, I mean, everything you do will convert into a higher turnover. There's money in the bank. And if you have a client that's a web shop owner and you increase their, their turnover by 30% in three months, they will, they will love you. I mean, you will be the supplier for the next 10 years. You will get Christmas presents from them and stuff like that. I, I have a few clients like that. So uh, one of them is selling Legos. So every year he sends me a box of Legos uh, for, for my, my son, Emil. So uh, last year he got the, 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 the big, um, what's it called? The, the, the Han Solo's big ship. Exactly, yeah, Millennium Falcon. So he got that one sent uh, from the customer just as a little appreciation. So, um, but, but yeah, just do it. Start somewhere, get working with it, and ask three questions, find three answers, get it up in a module, start to respond, also your template a little, and work your way into it. Down the line, of course, you start to ask a lot more complex questions and you need more data power. You need some machine learning to actually process the data and stuff like that. But even small stems can have a big importance and a big impact right now because there's no one else doing it. So basically, with four hours to spare, you get to be one of the first movers in an emerging market and do some disruption. So, any more questions? Yes? Yeah, but, 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 but when you start somewhere, you can start with simple categorization. But in reality, I want to move away from categorization completely. I don't care what people are, who they are at all, because I look at their behavior. So if people are clicking images, I just, I used the old stereotype in the advertising world of the images clicking, uh, the women clicking the images. But in reality, I don't care who's clicking the images. If people are showing a behavior where they click images, I will do bigger images. I will change product images into full images. Consider this, everyone in here knows IKEA, yes? An IKEA store is built, so you go into IKEA, you spend four hours walking around in IKEA, and you're looking at all the rooms with all the, the scenario pictures. Oh, it's a bed, there's some drapings, there's a pillow, there's a closet. You understand the context of what they're telling you. Then after four hours, you get down to all the stock uh, shelves where you walk around for, uh, for hours. Oh, 28, 45, 95, I need four of these. 
and then you go up to the cash uh, to the cashier and you buy your stuff and you leave again. Consider if IKEA did not have the first four hour experience of walking around and looking at all the scenario pictures, but you went into IKEA, you went down to all the shelves and you picked the individual stuff you needed, you went to the cash and you went home, IKEA sales would drop by 98% or more. Because IKEA found out that people at shops in IKEA react not on product images, but on product stories, on scenario pictures. So then the intelligent question might be, how come that 99% of all web shops on this planet is showing product images and not scenario images. There's a clear behavior across any segment of tendency. So why are we not using it? Why are we not reacting to it? So actually, I want to get to a level where any form of categorization of people based on who they are is completely meaningless. It's how they do it. It's the pattern they are part of. It's the patterns I want. And people do have identical patterns. People across the globe are showing identical patterns. And that patterization of categorization is what's important. Uh, not, not in terms of web world, web world, nothing like that. That's why, that, yeah, that's why I went back to machinery. There's, a t I mean, in the machinery world, optimizations of production plants and facilities, there's the, you can wheel them out from the library. So many books have been written on it. Or the entire implementation of Lean in Japan was actually based on some of these ideas to, and to use the users and their responses in their everyday workday to do something differently and to optimize things and stuff like that. So, so there is in computer science, the traditional one, there's a lot of material on response time, load times and stuff like that. It's all old school IT. Uh, and there's many in marketing, people have written books, professors have done studies and everything like that. But in terms of web development or websites, there really isn't a lot to work with. So, so in our world, I mean, in, if people invent a new way to do high-speed bandwidth, then it will be someone at the university that made a theory about something and someone will do a PhD on it, it becomes a new product. In web development, someone built something and we made something new. So we don't have, in, in, in web development, we don't have a, a, a theoretical background for letting university PhD create new technologies. We built it. Someone gets an idea, builds it, or does it, or, or holds a, a, a presentation at a conference about it, and then it's a new thing. So, so we have a different pattern on how we invent things. It's much more practical, it's much closer to the users than you do in traditional uh, machinery or technology or industries. So it's, it's a different way we do it. So there isn't a lot of reading material, and that's also why this is not about showing you a, a fact list and five things to do. This is about inspiring you to think about it, how you can use it to something. So hopefully, we together can create a movement where we make better websites, where we can do the market disruption, do something new about it. So uh, how much time do we have? Two minutes. Two minutes. One last question. Yes. Yeah, one of the ways you could do it was instead of using Google Analytics, you can use Google Prediction API, which is a machine learning API where you send data over to and have massive machine power built for machine learning. So they will be able to recognize patterns and deliver them back to you. That's one way of doing it. Prediction.io is an open new software platform that got started two years ago. You can download it, set it up on a server, and you can use it. And then you can send data over to that one. But there's simpler ways of doing it, too. I mean, we, we build a small browser library to record patterns. And we have It's on GitHub, on a red core. Search for red core on GitHub, the small browser library. It will recognize patterns, save it to a history. Once to use it out, we just let it go again. If you didn't let it go again, but actually stored the pattern and then started to look at what people were buying in your web shop, then you have prediction, very low tech. I think we could finish the, the, the prediction part for our red shop business to business in maybe three or four hours. It wouldn't require a lot. So uh, Christian, you look forward to do that on Monday, right? Yeah, super.
So, um, yeah, but, but, but this is some, uh, an emerging market. Right now, most are, are focused on prediction, on machine learning and prediction. But that's only one little part of it. There's so much more to it. So, okay, last question. Then we're out. Are we already out? Sunday afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming. I think uh, it was good Sunday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>